Texas, Nevada. I'm on my way to Studio Contagious, whose owner has won awards in the musical industry. Here in Las Vegas, he is also known for his outstanding photography, specializing in unforgettable shots of beautiful models. His wife has an unusual history, a history few women would speak about, let alone acknowledge. She has not only gone public with it, but uses the experiences, the pain, and the wisdom that she has gained from it to educate and protect others from the same fate. You guessed it, she's the one I have come to Las Vegas to see. Her name is Christine Marie. Ladies and gentlemen, right now you're seeing things inside the Contagious Studio. Contagious is the name because it truly is the joy, the art, the emotion, the mood, the love is truly contagious here. And you are about to meet a marvelous woman. The woman that you're looking at is the beautiful Christine Marie. Christine Marie is a marvelous photographer, a great businesswoman, but she is much more than that. Over the past few years, Christine has become a hero to many women, helping them find their identity, their belief in themselves, and to see themselves very differently. Please welcome Christine Marie. Thank you. We want to honor you today by telling the public what you have gone through, what you survived, and how you have come to have the courage to speak about it and use the wisdom you gained from it to help other people, especially women, overcome these same tragedies. Thank you. Let me start by recapping my story. I've been in the media sharing my story a couple of different times. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Let me tell you a little bit about my background. I was raised in a small town in Michigan. I converted to the mainstream Mormon church as a teenager. I was very devout. I went on a mission. I got married in the temple. I raised four children, and I got divorced. Things didn't go so well. When I was single, I ended up moving to Utah and looking for the beginning of the rest of my life. But I met somebody at a Mormon single camp who ultimately represented himself as having a calling that was being overseen by the mainstream Mormon church. And that calling was that he was in the process of translating the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon. After some time, and, and, and a number of people involved in helping deceive me, I believed it. I read the first eight chapters, and I thought, you know, this could be true. And to make a long story short, there was a process, a grooming process, which enabled my mind to get open so that I would believe this. And there were many comparisons with the beautiful church that I already believed in, this man, this prophet was uh, a former member of the Mormon Church who had an extra grind. He basically wanted to teach all members of the church a lesson that he was superior. He was an atheist, but I didn't know it at the time. What happened is once I believed that he was a prophet, that gave him the power to cause me to be obedient. When he Proceeded, he, the first thing he did is he took me as his spiritual wife. And basically, when I rejected him, he schemed a way to get even, and he did this, um, this antic. This is a man I would have never dated in real life, just for the fun of it. He didn't have 
the values that I appreciated or shared. He wasn't my type. He was very charismatic, but, you know, I was dating a lot of other very wonderful men who were successful, uh, unselfish, caring, funny, handsome. So he didn't really have to stand a chance with me. And so he pulled a maneuver. The maneuver was to represent himself as having translated the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon. Now, if you know anything about Mormon culture, the Book of Mormon is the bedrock of the faith. And I loved it. I read it many, many, many times. I wrote a book about it. I had a very deep testimony of it. So, when he, he represented that he translated the rest of the Book of Mormon, I thought it was unreasonable, but not, not impossible. In the Book of Mormon, there is a prophecy that in the last days, the remainder of the book would come forward and there would be a prophet who translated these, these remaining documents, which are scriptures, you know, a record of the ancient American people. So, to you, in the outside world, this seems crazy. But if you come from a culture that believes in the Book of Mormon, and everybody in the church believes that one day the field portion of the Book of Mormon is going to come forward, you know, it, it, it wasn't as irrational to me. Christine, both of us, you and I, were raised on the fundamental beliefs of Mormonism. And for both of us, our beliefs, our beliefs were used to entrap us. Fear and well put. There's no difference here. He knew what your basic belief system and convictions were. And he pretended to know more about it than you did. And then he used that to entrap you. Over and over, I've heard people say, well, how could these women be suckered in? It's quite simple. They take their value system, their own personal value system, and make them believe that they are not living up to the values that they should be living up to, their own values. And they gradually weave a web where the women get in deeper and deeper and deeper by constructing forms of assumption that the women are not living up to their own values of their own faith and their own integrity. And they twist it. They really twist it. But it takes time to move this web. It takes time to set them up. It takes time to groom them for their own destruction. Absolutely. You know, at the time, I didn't understand grooming. Grooming is a process that a predator uses to slowly change your mind one little step at a time, and you don't realize it's taking place, to influence you, to provide consequences when you don't do what they want, they provide rewards when you move in the direction they want. And it's a gentle, loving process well, in the course. beginning. It takes a long time to gently coerce and groom them, guide them, push them, manipulate them. It takes a long time. They want you to believe that they are your best friend that they care more about you than anybody else in this world. The reality is, they don't care about you at all. If they cared about you, they wouldn't be doing what they're doing and what they're going to do to destroy your life. Absolutely. It's a hallmark of a sociopath. A sociopath and a psychopath, by the way, are essentially the same thing. But today we use the term sociopath more. But think of it as a uh, a person who has no conscience. So, 
my particular psychopath, sociopath, was very charming, smart. He totally came across like somebody intelligent, confident, righteous. He emulated Christ in his words. He quoted scripture. And as far as I could see through my examinations, I couldn't see anything wrong with him. I thought, well, he could be. He, maybe he really is this new prophet. And in the beginning, because I was such a faithful, um, devoted Mormon mother, I really wanted to know, for obvious reasons, that he was telling me the truth. And I wanted to make sure that I wasn't getting involved in some kind of fringe group or one of these apostate groups or anything like that. So I, you know, I questioned everything. I talked to my friends about it. I wasn't supposed to, but I shared the things that he had written. So this sealed portion, um, the, these first eight chapters, and you know, some of my friends said, you know, it's possible. It doesn't seem likely though. It seems like it would have come through the church if it was really the sealed portion. Well, what he told me at the time is that he didn't have a very good background if I were to check his background because for a few years he had been running from his calling. If God had given him this calling, which is basically a job in the church, that's what a calling is. And in the Mormon tradition, the, you know, in our mindset, if you get a calling, you, it's a calling from God. If you're one of your church leaders gives you a calling, you accept it. That's basically a message to you from the Lord's appointed um, hierarchy that are trying to help refine you and use your talents to bless other people. Well, so my prophet received his calling as a prophet supposedly uh, you know, somewhat earlier than, than when I met him, he said that he received it from the laying out of hands, that he um, he had this very dramatic way, story about how he received the gold plate, which was parallel to the Joseph Smith story, only for modern day. He was playing off all the things that I already believed. And when I tried to check his background, he gave me some references. I, I, you know, communicated with other supposed believers, and they confirmed these miracles that they saw around him. And it, it was just like this perfect storm of circumstances for me to to have met him and to have worked out, so that I ended up believing that that he really had translated these ancient documents. Just like Mark Hoffman represented that he had authentic documents and sold them to the church you know, years earlier, my predator w was following his, his pattern. And in fact, I later learned that he, Mark Hoffman was essentially one of his icons in life because he was able to deceive the church and earn a living by defrauding members of the church. Well, your predator, Christine, pretended to be your greatest friend, pretended to be knowledgeable, more knowledgeable than you, in the things that you cared about the most. He gradually manipulated you and twisted things until your greatest strength, your faith, became your greatest weakness. And that was his plan. I would say that my greatest strength became the hole. That was the hole that he could poke through. He used the things that were the most important to you in your whole life to groom you and to entrap you. Right, because he First of all, he knew how to do it. Virtually all girls that are entrapped in polygamy are entrapped because of their
belief system because of the way they were raised and cultured to live a life subservient and obedient basically sets them up for massive, massive manipulation. Right. This applies whether you have been born into it or are entrapped into it because of your faith. Sure. One common myth that the public repeats is that these people in these cults must have been so weak. And this is the opposite of the truth. You can't be controlled by a cult leader or a prophet, somebody like Warren Jeff. You can't be controlled by these men if you're weak. If you're weak, then when they tell you to make a sacrifice, if you're weak in the faith and they tell you to make a sacrifice you don't want to make, you're going to leave. Right. It's the strong ones, the strong in faith, the people with strong personalities that are the most manipulatable. As a matter of fact, it's, um, there's a professor named Yanya Lelich who talks about what kind of people end up converting into these high demand groups or cults. And contrary to popular belief, it's people who are intelligent, who have a vision for life where they really want to make a difference in the world. They're seekers of truth. They're really good people. Cult leaders don't want to attract weak, unsuccessful people into their group. They want money. They want prestige. They want people who can benefit them. And my particular uh, cult leader slash predator was just the same. So he, when he met me, I was I was successful. I. I moved to Utah because I had recently received funding for a business that could have been, you know, um, extraordinary. And I was the perfect sugar mama. So he he couldn't win me on his own merit for marriage, so he became the, the best at his game. He became the prophet because I was so faithful he knew that would be something that I would not disobey. And that is a word I don't use lightly because our relationship, after he made me his spiritual wife, he gave me tests of obedience. As my prophet, he was my ecclesiastical leader. So he was like my priest. So if you think of these you know, self-appointed prophets in the offshoots of Mormonism, you should think of them as ecclesiastical leaders that have been ordained by churches. Because even though they're self-appointed, they have tremendous power over you, like a priest has over his congregation. After my experience was over, one of the things I was shocked to learn was that the most abused sector of the religious community were adult females. I thought that ecclesiastical abuse happened primarily to young boys. But uh, according to some studies, 90% of those abused by their ecclesiastical leaders are not young boys, but females over 18. In polygamy, whether you were born into it or whether you were converted into it, you're right. Most women that are manipulated, used, and entrapped in polygamy are adult women. The methods of controlling them are convincing them that somehow, some way, they are not pleasing God, that they're not sacrificing everything that they are and have or want. To someone else in the name of being a good woman. And in the finale, nice and stupid are synonymous terms in the world of the con man. This amazing 
it's an amazing thing to think about because had this not happened to me, I would have thought that the women in polygamy are happy, that this was a victimless crime, and that it was a matter of consenting at all. One of the blessings of going through this experience is that I've been given a perspective that I think is unique and valuable, at least to some people. For one thing, everybody has sympathy for the child bride. It is a heinous crime that should never happen. And there is support. Because it's natural. It's natural to feel horrified that somebody who's 70 would want to marry somebody who's 16 or, or even younger. So there's sympathy there that's already built in. But I think of cases like one young woman named Rachel Strong, and she was 19. Okay, so she was an adult, yet she was groomed and manipulated and psychologically coerced by her ecclesiastical leader, who also happened to be her stepfather. But the fact that he was the prophet put those two in a special trust relationship, like, you know, what attorneys have with their clients, the doctor-patient relationship is a special trust relationship, or if you're a therapist, you're not supposed to have physical relations with a patient, that would be a crime, because that is considered a special trust because of the vast imbalance of power. Are you aware that her stepfather was also found guilty of being a con man and taking the property of many, many people? Well, wouldn't you know it? Because these prophets or their designated spokespeople, the, you know, whether they're called a bishop or whether it's a, some cult leader and guru thing, because they have such an imbalance of power, they have a direct line to God. They have all the answers. You can't question their authority because the women have been raised in a culture of obedience or at least converted to a culture of obedience. They know that to question is okay if they do, as long as they don't disobey. But if they question to the point where they're not going to, you know, be part of the you know, the Holy Order anymore, or this very special group of chosen people, then they will lose their eternal happiness. They will lose their eternal families. They won't be with their children. And the, these men at the top of these polygamous groups are essentially all con men. They, they are in this special trust relationship, which should make the crime even worse. If you're a therapist and you order your patient to marry you, you would go to prison. And those, those laws should also apply to self-appointed prophets or, or whether they're self-appointed or not. These leaders over their flock, they have that imbalance of power that makes it impossible for any member of their flock to give consent to sexual relations. There is no such thing as consent. While many people said to you, well, you weren't even in one of those polygamous cults, it doesn't matter. The modus operandi to make you sacrifice everything you had, forfeit your money, your home, everything you had, to use you in the name of God, was exactly, exactly the same. The method of taking advantage of you and destroying your life, your self-confidence, and your reason for living is the same. The concept that a good woman sacrifices everything she has and is if she loves is ridiculous. The concept that a good woman has a role of nothing more than eternal sacrifice is what they try 
to make you believe and do. And they accomplish it and destroy many, many lives. In polygamy, everyone was imprisoned by a prison of the mind through their faith. Very well said. One thing I repeat a lot is that change can be psychological. And I know that from my experience. So in my story, I have this self-appointed prophet, and I have these believers around me who are supporting everything that he says. I'm being, I was drained of my financial resources. I had to make excruciating sacrifices. I was exploited in ways that are painful to remember. And I ultimately believed that I was then demoted from being the first wife to, to being sort of a slave wife. My prophet had a revelation which was emailed to me because he wrote it by hand. And it was transcribed by um, his, his new fiancé. And the fiancé, I call her Sister Jackson, Sister Jackson was supposedly the administrator of the fund to help the poor and needy. And Sister Jackson typed up his revelation. And keep in mind, all the money and resources that I had and dreams and everything that I sold for the translation of the sealed portion of the gold plate was compared to what they did in the early days of the church. The people sacrificed their, like the women sacrificed their fine china to put into the, the Nauru temple so that their walls would be all sparkly. And they gave up homes and they, you know, they mortgaged their homes to pay for the printing of the Book of Mormon, things like that. So the sacrifices were, were part of our culture that you, you commit to, to share your resources, your time, talent, energy, everything to the building of the kingdom of God. And I had no problem with that, believing that what I was doing was really building the kingdom of God. But once I was in this, this, this psychological place where I had passed these tests and sacrificed things that were precious to me, my critical thinking started to turn off. 